I'm with the Latino Coalition. We are co-hosting uh, this great event uh, in coordination with the League of Women Voters. There is no greater partner that we can have for doing this very important civic duty. Our coalition exists for one purpose only, and that is to promote greater awareness and understanding within our multicultural community, uh, which is very vibrant here in the Tri-Cities. We work with the League of Women Voters on not only candidates forums, but also on voter registration drives throughout the year. So we have a, an active partnership uh, ongoing, in which we'll continue, we believe. It is my pleasure tonight to introduce your moderator, uh, and that would be uh, Mr. Uh, Mike Gonzalez. He is the uh, news director and evening news anchor for KVEW. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez has uh, a distinguished uh, career in, um, in, uh, in the news profession. He's been uh, with uh, 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 NBC affiliates in Raleigh. Uh, he's been in Columbia, Missouri. He's been in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. Most recently, he was in uh, Spokane, where he served as uh, the main evening news anchor at the ABC affiliate. Um, he has uh, won awards at every step of the way for his, uh, his news reporting and his uh, exceptional um, journalistic skills. So it is indeed with um, uh, a great pleasure that I introduce to you, the moderator for this evening's um, uh, Congressional Candidates Forum, Mr. Mike Gonzalez. Please welcome him. Felix, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. Uh, like you said, I'm Mike Gonzalez. Uh, I'm the news director and evening anchor at the ABC affiliate in town. So my one shameless plug, tune in at 5 and 6.30, so, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, but uh, honored to be a part of this forum. Uh, really appreciate Mr. Didier, uh, Mr. Newhouse, for allowing me to be a part of this, and uh, for everybody uh, coming here and being a part of it as well. Uh, no better state than the state of Washington. Uh, as he said, I've lived all across the country. I most recently came from Raleigh, North Carolina, but the state of Washington came uh, calling me back all the way from Miami, but I'm definitely a Washingtonian, that's for sure. All right, well, let's get started. You know, tonight we're going to be hearing from the candidates for the 4th Congressional District, Clint Didier to my right, and current Congressman Dan Newhouse. I'm going to go over some of the ground rules here for the candidates. They're a little bit different from some of the previous races. Each candidate will have two minutes for an opening statement. We'll then move on to the question and answer portion of the program. They'll have up to two minutes to answer those questions. The League and Latino Coalition have prepared questions, but we'll also be taking questions from the audience. There are three by five cards available if you'd like to submit a question. Uh, we'll ask that they be about issues and not of personal nature. We don't want to know what they like, like to eat for dinner or their favorite genre music or you, you know you get it and uh, if you can write as legibly as possible because I've got to sort of decipher them up here and I know my my handwriting depend on depending on how I'm feeling that day is better than others that's for sure uh, both candidates have the opportunity to answer each question uh, they will end with a one minute closing and in the order in the order of opening and closing statement was determined by a coin toss and we're going to begin with Mr. Newhouse Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez, and I want to thank the um, League of Women Voters as well as the Latino Coalition for holding this forum this evening, and I want to thank especially everyone that's in the room and everyone that's tuning in. I appreciate your engagement in our political process. It's vital for a successful uh, country, and so thank you very much for taking time this evening. You know, I originally ran for public office because of one very important thing. I was growing... Uh, increasingly frustrated because of all the rules and the regulations and the laws that kept coming down impacting my ability to run my business, impacting my, fa my family, and impacting the neighbors around me in, in the very same way. So I got involved in my community and got involved as a farmer in my, my commodity groups in the Washington State Farm Bureau, different ways that I thought I could make a difference. I, so, but I wanted a wider impact, so I ran for office. And through that public service that I've been fortunate enough to be able to participate in in the state legislature, as well as being the director of the Washington State Department of Agriculture, has given me tremendous experience that I've been able to take to Washington, D.C. and represent you successfully on your behalf. It's given me a, a great opportunity to do some of the things that are necessary, skills that are necessary to do this job well. And so whether it's making sure we have the resources uh, that we need for the Hanford cleanup, whether it's making sure that our agricultural industry continues to be successful, whether it's making sure our veterans 
get the important care that they need, or just helping uh, everyday folks cutting through the federal bureaucracy, the red tape that so often is a challenge for them when they deal and when they interact with federal agencies. Those are the kinds of things that I work very hard on every day, the kinds of things that make me proud of the accomplishments I've had. Just this weekend, I got the endorsement from our two major newspapers, the Tri-City Herald, as well as the Yakima Herald. I'm very proud of that. I also have a, a strong grassroots organization, a lot of support up and down the district, and I humbly ask for your support and your vote so I can continue to work on your behalf in Washington. Thank you, Mr. Didier. Well, I'd like to thank the Latino Coalition, League of Women Voters, and Mr. Gonzalez, Great job. Thank you're you. very successful in your, your, uh, your uh, avenue of... of uh, you're the one that watches, huh? The only one? No, no, I'm just, well, I'm I'm just kidding. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, everything that Dan has stated, we have got no relief from in the two years of Congress that he's been there. In fact, Dan has really shown poor judgment in his voting. He voted for John Boehner right off the bat for Speaker of the House. And I see a lot of elderly people in the room. And in that 2015 budget that he pushed through, he stole $150 billion out of the Social Security Fund. Now, they said I was going to do that as a single congressman, which was a big lie. A single congressman can't do that. But the Congress did. They stole $150 billion out of your retirement fund. Then he voted for Ryan, and they pushed through the omnibus bill, which funded Planned Parenthood, Sanctuary Cities, $1.6 billion to bring Syrian refugees into America. He voted to expand the Patriot Act. That's the government spying on you. He voted for the Import-Export Bank. This is where government picks winners and losers. He voted to repeal the country of origin labeling. This is when you go to the grocery store now and you pick up a package of meat. We have just received 62 metric tons of beef from Brazil. And they have a severe hoof and mouth disease down there. This is coming into your stores and you're going to buy this with no regard to food safety for you. He also is very, he's, he's voted for the TPA, Trans-Pacific Authority, that's the TPP and the TTIP. More acronyms than you can keep track of, I'm telling you. But this is government. It's just keep, it keeps growing and growing. And Dan has done nothing to try to rein in this federal government that's out of control. He has just been a participant. He has actually aided and abetted this growth of government. Thank you. Thank you both gentlemen. We will now move on to the question portion of this event. Each candidate also has been given two challenge cards and at any time they can offer those up. But the opponent will also have a chance to rebut a rebuttal. So you have 45 seconds on your rebuttal and you'll have another 45 seconds to answer that rebuttal. We could have four challenges in total in hopes of keeping this fair and moving along. We ask that you hold your applause until the end. I will now begin with questions from our sponsor. And our first question is for Mr. Didier. It's on international trade. Washington state is the most trade dependent state in the country. One in three jobs in our state, including agriculture, is tied to trade. Current national presidential debate has painted trade agreements such as the proposed Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, as it's known as a bad deal for America. Where do you stand on trade and what will you do in Congress to bring bipartisan agreement on trade? Well, ladies and gentlemen, as a farmer, I depend on trade. And it is uh, very important that we have trade with foreign countries. That's one of the primary responsibilities of the federal government. But, to, but this TPP and TTIP, first of all, it's 5,553 5, pages long. That's 2,000 pages longer than Obamacare. It is a Trojan horse, horse for immigration. It may foist gun control on Americans. It threatens internet freedom. It's not about free trade. Five of 29 chapters deal with trade. It's planned in secret, locked down in a vault. Only the congressmen and, and senators could go down and read it, and they weren't even allowed to take notes or pictures of anything of that TPP and TTIP. This is not the way we do trade. And every time we have put these trade deals together, we are being outmaneuvered by our adversaries not adversaries, our trading people that we're trading with. As soon as the trade deal is put into place, <laughs> there's currency manipulation. 
and then we're on the losing end. We, we uh, export less than we import, and we lose. And these trade deals, NAFTA, this one, it's going to kill union jobs. If you've got anybody working for unions, they're going to possibly lose their job because this, that's what it is. It is bad for America. We want America to succeed. We want American jobs. We want our industries to vamp up and run again. And right now, we're not getting that. Our industries are being stymied by, by all of this regulation, and our, our people aren't working. We need jobs, and we need an industrial revolution in America. And all hands on deck, let's get her done. Thank you, Congressman Newhouse. The state of Washington is the best situated state of the lower 48 to take advantage of, of the growing markets in the Pacific Rim. It's true. 40% of the jobs in our state rely in some way on international trade, 40%. 26% of our economy is dependent on this international trade. It's huge. You know, I don't know about you, I can only eat so many apples. We need to have these international markets for our producers, for our processors, for our, our manufacturers, to have ability to be able to have markets open to them. TPA, Trans Promotion Authority, gave Congress the ability to set the standard for what these trade agreements should have and the ability to vote up or vote down on them. So I thought that that was a good thing. TPP, 12 other nations in the Pacific Rim is something that we're working on in order to increase our ability to export, lower and reduce tariffs to make our products more competitive. I think that's a great thing. Now, there are some issues with the TPP. There really are, and I hope the administration addresses those. But currently, it looks as though when both presidential candidates have come out against, both leaders in both branches, or both Senate and the House have said, we're not gonna consider it this year. It doesn't look to me like it's even gonna come for a vote, but that's okay, because there are some things that need to be fixed in that. There are some issues, but I, on, at, on the bottom line, I support making sure that our producers, our processors, have more opportunities to be successful by having markets available to them on a level playing field. Thank you. Congressman Newhouse, this is a question from our audience. What is your pos position on reducing gun violence in this country? Well, I am very concerned, like many Americans, with the uh, number of um, attacks on our police forces, a number of uh, shootings in public places or schools and theaters and uh, shopping malls, uh, all kinds of, of things in this country that I think I share with everyone concern. But I don't think that the first response should be uh, impinging, impeding, taking away the constitutional rights of law-abiding citizens by in some way reducing their ability to own a firearm. I think we need to look at other things, other things that were, would be a better solution. Things like making sure, and we talked, the, the issue was brought up with our judge candidates, making sure the resources are there so that we can address the mental health issues in our country, to make sure that folks that can't make the proper decisions aren't allowed to have those guns uh, in, in, in possession to begin with. I also think that we may need to make sure that our police forces have all the proper training and resources and tools available to them so that they can do the best they can. And we need, it's incumbent upon us to make sure they have those tools. But I also think I, I would say to all of us, to all citizens of the United States, that we have a responsibility too, as law-abiding citizens to respect and assist our law enforcement officers as they're trying to protect us. That's something that is incumbent upon each and every one of us. Thank you, Mr. Didier. Well, first of all, our law enforcement have been undermined. And it started in Cambridge when they, they were told they were acting stupidly. There's been a constant undermining of our police force across the United States. And why is that? It's because Loretta Lynch in November of last year, along with Obama, has proposed this global police force that is already in place today in America. 
I encourage you to look up the articles and start reading on this because they announced this November of last year. There's a move to undermine our police forces and to install a new global police force that we will lose our constitutional rights to. Now, I think a big way to stop these mass shootings is to get rid of the gun-free zones because this is just enticing someone with some very bad intentions to have an avenue to perform these horrendous acts on our society. As a Second Amendment lover, and I love my Second Amendment rights, they were granted to us in the Constitution when the Declaration shall not be infringed are very strong words. I encourage education on proper gun usage, even into our schools. Because honestly, if we don't educate our kids how to properly handle a tool, that's what it is, then how do we expect them to handle it if they ever find one? This is a problem that we have. We have a lot of people that are scared of it. And it can't shoot anybody by itself. It takes fingers to pull the trigger. And as far as mental illness, we need to secure our borders. The drugs that are coming across that border is what's creating this mental illness wave, this increase in our country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Didier. Mr. Didier, do you support any kind of path to citizenship for undocumented immigrants who are now living in the United States? If so, what criteria would you require? And if not, how do you think our country should deal with this issue? Well, first and foremost, on the immigration issue, unless we secure our borders, we are compounding the problem. It's just getting worse. First and foremost, secure our borders. How do we do this without increasing cost on a $20 trillion deficit? We use our military, ladies and gentlemen. It's already in place. They need a place to train. Every topography that you could imagine that our military would fight on is there. Woods, hills, bluffs, use our drones, all the new technology, get a half mile width, if it's state parks or federal, we already got access, as long as the state will grant it. If it's private land, believe me, they will grant access. And we let our military train on a half mile or a one mile swath, and everybody says the wall won't work. Exactly. El Chapo has proven he can tunnel anywhere. And so we use our military. Nobody will dig if an Abram tank is driving over top of them. And we stop the immigration. now. The people that are here, yes, we got to have a pathway to citizenship because I know some people that have been here 20, 30 years and have been paying taxes and have been working and being part of our communities. Their children were born here. I know a few of them and they need to be granted access and access to citizenship. What do we do about them breaking the law? Well. One form would be community service. Another would be a fine. There has to be some form of retribution. They broke the law by being here illegally. But that doesn't mean that we export them. That means we, we allow them to redeem themselves, get in line, assimilate, and become an American, and learn English for the quickest, fastest upward mobility. Thank you, Congressman Newhouse. Uh, thank you, Mike. You know, we here in central Washington, I think we, we live on the front lines of this immigration issue. This is a big issue. And I think it's one of the most important things that we face and something that we just have to solve, and I'm committed to doing just that. Um, we have approximately, some people say, 11 million undocumented uh, people in this country. I don't know that we know exactly the number. Uh, and as Mr. Didier said, some of them have been here a long time and are contributing members of our communities. I, I have many friends that, that fall into that category. Some have been here since they were young children. Know no other country but the United States. Uh, maybe don't even speak the language of the, of the foreign country from whence their, their ancestors came. I think that we, as many other countries in this world, have to figure out a way that we can provide a pathway to legal status for these individuals. If they have no serious criminal record, other than overstaying their visas or sneaking across the border, 
If they pay a fine, make sure they're paying their taxes, learn English. I think that we can do that. Once we've given them that legal status, then they're able to come across the border legally, come here to work legally, and then you know what? Then they could go back home legally if they want to, to see their families. To me, that just makes a lot of sense. As far as citizenship, absolutely. If they fulfill all these require, other requirements, we have a process to, to gain citizenship in this country. And I would advocate that once they are qualified in these other areas to gain legal status, then they can also get them back of the line and, and uh, go for legal citizenship if that's what they want. Thank you. Thank you. We do have a challenge card from Mr. Didier. And that gives me 45 seconds? Yes, it does, sir. Mr. Newhouse speaks of this concern, but yet he voted for the omnibus bill. Now, I want you to realize he voted for the omnibus bill that funded $1.6 billion to bring Syrian refugees in from Syria and Iraq. Now, I just watched the 60 Minutes last night. The UN's vetting them. Why are we, the United States, vetting them? But more importantly, what about the people that have been here waiting patiently to become citizens with the executive amnesty and the omnibus bill as soon as they show up they are granted citizenship in front of all of those people that are waiting patiently to become citizens how do we answer that when we vote for an omnibus bill when we say we want a pathway to citizenship thank you Car yes you do you get 45 seconds the omnibus bill sounds ominous, doesn't it? Actually, through that bill, the total number of refugees coming into this country was actually reduced, and we increased the amount of vetting that went into those refugees. So I think that was a good step forward. Um, there is no instant citizenship for Syrian refugees. There, is, there just isn't. It doesn't exist. Um, as far as Syrian refugees and the danger they pose to this country, I voted on two different bills to uh, make sure that they can't come in here without proper vetting, to put a pause on their immigration until we know whether they're coming here out of uh, uh, trying to get away from a war-torn country or trying to do us harm. I think that's a, one of the biggest responsibilities that I have as a U.S. Congressman, and I've, I've done very well at that. Thank you, Congressman Newhouse. On that note, an audience question for you. You have stated that the omnibus bill did not include $1.6 billion to fund Syrian refugees, that it did not include funding for Planned Parenthood or executive amnesty. All of these provisions were indeed in the 2015 bill, according to this question anyway. Do you wish to now change your statement? There were provisions for refugees, I believe, in the omnibus bill, but uh, not an increase, like my opponent seems to, to con, uh, contend. Uh, there were provisions, like I said, to make sure that these people are properly vetted. You know, we're a country that has, for centuries, had open arms for people that are, are fleeing uh, other countries because of their fear for their lives. But in this day and age that we live, we have to take precautions to make sure that those folks are not coming here for nefarious purposes. Islamic radical terrorists have stated specifically they will infiltrate these flow of refugees to do us harm and to do other countries harm as well. And that's why I have done everything I can to make sure that we know what their intentions are before people can come. So we put limitations, we paused, we've gone through all kinds of actions to do that. As far as Planned Parenthood, uh, there was an amendment to the omnibus bill that uh, forbids any taxpayer dollars to be used for abortions. So yes, I supported that part of it. There was, uh, I have a 100% rating with one of the largest and oldest uh, pro-life organizations in the country who stated that no member of Congress who voted for this bill did anything contrary to protecting life in this country. And so uh, I stand by my record. I do not wish to change what I've said previously. And, and I'm, like I said in the outset, I'm proud of the votes I've taken on the behalf of the people in the 4th District. Thank you. Mr. Didier. Last night, I hope you watched 60 Minutes on the Syrian refugee. That $1.6 billion was to bring 10,000 Syrian refugees into America. Currently, they have brought in 13,000. 
they brought in more than they were allotted. And Hillary wants to bring in 65,000. Now that, on to Planned Parenthood, they say that that didn't fund Planned Parenthood. They just had their 100th anniversary. And when you look at the crosses of all the men and women that have served this great land, that have perished, it is nowhere close to the amount of crosses per 10,000 per cross of the abortions in America. The amendment that Dan speaks of is the Hyde Amendment. That only, that only is applied to Medicaid, I believe, is all where it's applied to, where funds for Medicaid cannot be used for abortion. It has no applying to all the rest of the abortions. It fully funded Planned Parenthood and with the increase. This is what happens when our government doesn't run on regular order. And we were promised that after the omnibus bill had passed. Here we are in September, and they passed a continuing resolution. Now, my opponent says he's very proud of his votes. If he was proud of them, he would have voted for the continuing resolution. He now voted against the continuing resolution. And when pressed in Yakima, what is he going to do December 9th when the continuing resolution runs out? He spoke of another omnibus bill in three different packages through in September. I think the next Congress and administration needs to set, set the budget for this country. And no more omnibus bills. Thank you, Mr. Didier. <clears throat> Mr. Didier, this question is for you. Federal crop insurance was created in 1938. It was made mandatory in 1994. The mandatory part was rescinded in 1996. But in order to receive benefits for insurance, you have to have that insurance. It's, in, it's required. Three-fourths of the claims are due to drought, excess moisture, or even hail. Between 1980 and 2005, $43.6 billion were paid out. The question is this. Do you think this program is working well, or would you support any changes? Let me just say this. I sat on the FSA State Committee. That's Farm Service Agency. Under Bush 43, I was appointed. And I sat on that for eight years. The first question I asked in that room of 50 people was, what, what percent of the farm bill is food stamps, child nutrition, temporary assistance for needy families? Nobody in the room could answer the question. The one lady said she'd have it for me after lunch. And she came in, and she was flabbergasted. She said, I can't believe it. It's 78%. 11% goes to the farmers, and there's other programs that come out of that. It's called a farm bill. Now, I know we're talking about insurance, and that's NAP insurance. And I participated in this, because when I got elected to that, I, I knew the uh, executive director really well, and he... Uh, he says, Clint, either you farm the programs and you farm the land or you won't be farming. And I took his advice and we participated. But it come around 2009, I told my sons and my wife, if we keep participating in this, we're aiding to the demise of our children because it's welfare, folks. If it's going to the farmers, it's, it's welfare. You see, this program through the government of insurance is fine and dandy, but you got to realize one thing. It's in competition with the private sector insurance, and they can't compete with government, as no private sector can compete with government in giving away good deals. Nobody can. And so I have, my wife and I, we have our own insurance. We no longer participate in this. We no longer participate in the farm programs. But my opponent received a healthy amount of money last year from the farm programs. And nobody has asked him about that. I'm wondering if he's hurting that bad that he needs it. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Newhouse. Let me first say that the, uh, the previous question about the Hyde Amendment absolutely forbids taxpayer money being fun funded to be used for providing for abortions. And you can do a word search of the omnibus bill for Planned Parenthood. Those two words don't exist in that bill. I just wanted to make that clear. The crop insurance program we have in the United States is much improved over what it was previously. Uh, the, the payments that were made to corporate farms, uh, sometimes the addresses were sent to penthouses in New York City, I understand. 
that kind of stuff has been in the previous farm farm bill has been uh, as far as I know taken taken away currently we have a system of crop insurance where the farmer has skin in the game well they they participate in the premiums that uh, I think crop insurance provides a very important safety net for the agricultural industry in this country where would we be if we depended totally on foreign sources for our food crops or uh, prices go up and prices go down, uh, having that safety net there in place, make sure that our agricultural industry can remain strong. Now, does it need further reform? I would say that uh, we continue. I haven't met a government program yet that doesn't need fur further reform. So absolutely, we have to provide tremendous scrutiny to make sure it's accomplishing what it's set out to do. It shouldn't be a welfare program. It should only provide a safety net in the worst of times so that our farmers can maintain a, a strong position to be there for us because at some point, we'll, obviously, we need them. We want to be able to feed our population. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Newhouse. Mm -hmm. Question from our audience here. Do you support H.R. 3765? This is the ADA Education and Reform Act of 2015. To put it in perspective, this bill requires the disability rights section of the DOJ to develop a program to educate state and local governments and property owners on strategies for promoting access to public accommodations for the disabled. Well, um, from what your description of, 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 the, uh, of the bill, Mike, it sounds as though that um, it's a positive thing to make sure that people are able to comply with federal law and that uh, Americans with disabilities then have in place uh, the proper um, facilities available to them uh, as, as they need it. Uh, without having further description of that bill, I'd certainly make sure I'm certainly in, in favor of uh, folks with disabilities to be able to um, maneuver and be have accessible everything that everyone else does. Uh, it comes uh, as, as uh, it's something that we've had in place for many years, and I would support continuing that. I, but I don't know any more details about that particular bill other than your description. Fair enough. Mr. Didier. What was the name of that bill again? It, uh is H.R. 3765, also known as the ADA Education and Reform Act of 2015. And the bill requires the disability rights section of the DOJ to develop a program to educate state and local governments and property owners on strategies for promoting access to public accommodations for the disabled. Absolutely not. I'm not in favor of that. The Department of Justice? I think we've already seen the Department of Justice and their actions here the last couple of days. And it ain't good. I'm saying states' rights supersede the federal government. We got to remember, folks, who created the federal government? Was it the colonies that created the government, or the federal government created the colonies? The federal government's way too involved in our integral part of lives. As the last time I looked, we have access in almost, it's mandatory now. You have to have wheelchair access, and I'm all for that. But we don't need the heavy hand of government coming in now and regulating us even more. And my opponent, yeah, sure, he's for big government. He's voted for it. I'm not. I'm for limited government. I'm for you to have more of your freedom. And I'm, I'm tired of this federal government. You look at it. They're in our bedrooms, our bathrooms, our kitchens, our living room. They're in everything we, our existence. They're watching us. I mean, I've had enough of it. I don't know. I'm not in, in favor of this bill. No. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Didier. A recent projection said Social Security can pay full benefits until the year 2037 when benefits funding would drop to 76 percent without any changes being made. Many suggestions have been made that could help secure the future of Social Security, such as raising the retirement age, increasing the taxable income limit, and the use of a means test. The question is this, would you support any of these measures and do you have any other suggestions that you think would help? Yes, and the first bill I will introduce as your next congressman is that every member of the House and every member of the Senate live by the same laws they pass on to you and I. So that means Social Security applies to them. We want to fix Social Security. We want to fix health care. We make our Congress stop living, stop living above us and live with us. 
because this is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. But we've allowed this elitist group to exempt themselves from everything they're applying on us. And this is one of my pet peeves, is because Social Security, you paid into. That's your money. And Dan showed poor judgment and voted for John Boehner in 2015, I reiterate. They stole $150 billion out of your Social Security fund. So that means it's going to fail even sooner. Now, I say enough is enough. Hands off Social Security. No more Robin Social Security. The young people out in the audience, I think it's our moral obligation to make sure we keep paying into Social Security, that these people that have paid in get the money out that they're due. But I want to propose that you can pay into your own Social Security private fund, tax-free in, tax-free out. So yes, you're going to have to pay a little more, but you're going to be guaranteed your retirement. Government won't be able to touch it. And no more touch in Social Security fund. This, this is despicable. And this is what I got accused of doing in the last election. I, a single congressman, were, was going to take your Social Security. That's the biggest lie there could ever be. And it didn't, it didn't, it did. It hurt the election. It hurt my chances of winning. Thank you. Congressman Newhouse. Could you repeat the question, Mike? Surely. Oh, hold on one second. Here's a question one more time, Congressman Newhouse. A recent projection said Social Security can pay full benefits until 2037 when benefits funding would drop to 76 percent without any changes being made. Many suggestions have been made that could help secure the future of Social Security, such as raising the retirement age, increasing the taxable income limit, and the use of a means test. The question is this. Would you support any of these measures, and do you have any other suggestions that you think would help? Well, first of all, let me say that I support um, making sure that uh, people in this country get the money that they've invested in the Social Security system. I'll do everything in my power to make sure that that system stays solvent and that uh, people get the, the return that they were promised by the government. Let me just clear up a couple of things. Social Security applies to me just like it does to you. The Affordable Care Act applies to me just like it does to you. Sometimes I wish it, that I didn't have to live under Obamacare, but I do. And, and to tell you the truth, I don't like it very much. And the, and the, the budget that uh, my opponent refers to, the, uh, the Budget Act of 2015, I voted no on that because I thought it took a wrong-headed approach to funding Social Security. So you can criticize me for voting for the speaker, but I voted no on that particular budget. I will keep uh, working hard to make Social Security as solvent as, as long as we possibly can to make it there for the Americans that have, have invested in it their whole lives. For many people, that's the only retirement that they can expect. And so absolutely, that's a commitment and a promise by the federal government to make sure it's there. Now, there's a lot of options, a lot of um, uh, things that are being talked about as part of the discussion in order to do that. Means testing is one. Raising the retirement age is another. I would not do that for people who are just on uh, the, the cusp of getting their Social Security checks. That would be totally unfair to pull it away from you right as you're about to get your check. For younger people that are just starting out in the system, that have a long working uh, p career ahead of them, that makes more sense. Americans are living longer than we used to. You know, life expectancy is tremendously improved over what it was in, in the 30s when Social Security was put into place. So I think that makes sense to be able to look at some of those things. But keeping the system solvent is absolutely essential. Thank you. We do have a challenge card from Mr. Didier, his second and final one. I encourage you to look that up yourself, folks. He's going to sit there and tell you one thing, and it's not true. This health care that they live by, they get to live by both means. The big employer, over 50 employees, so the government pays for their, their retirement, and then, or their health care, and then they get to live by the small. They get to pick and choose. They get both sides of it, where we only get one. You see, he's, he's talking out of both sides of his mouth. He's telling you one thing, and it's really another. 
you need to look it up yourself. And please look up the height, H-Y-D-E. It primary, primarily applies to Medicaid patients. <clears throat> Congressman Newhouse. So I wish it were true um, that I didn't have to abide by the Obamacare rules. Since coming into Congress and having to uh, get insurance through the federal government, my premiums have skyrocketed. My deductibles have gone way up. The out-of-pocket costs that uh, my wife and I have to pay are tremendously higher than they used to be. So I wish it were true uh, that what my opponent is saying. It would be a lot easier on me personally. But I think it's a good thing in another way, in kind of a perverse way, I suppose, because this is exactly what you folks are experiencing, too. I don't agree that uh, any laws that are passed by the federal government that Congress should be uh, not subject to. I think we need to live under the same rules, regulations, and laws as everybody else does, and I will continue to fight for that. Thank you. Congressman Newhouse, this comes from our audience. Please tell us one accomplishment you have made for our veteran community. Uh, the veterans of this country deserve everything we can do for them. They were, this is almost a cliche, but they were there for us, and we need to be there for them when they need us. I was very proud just a couple weeks ago to have a bill that I primary sponsored uh, pass off the House floor that will ensure that our veterans get the emergency care that they require when they present themselves to a VA hos hospital facility. Now you would think, why wasn't that law already? And I thought the same thing, but it wasn't. The VA was exempt from the, same, from the rules that private hospitals are, uh, have to abide by. In fact, we had a gentleman in Kennewick, Washington, as a matter of fact, who presented himself to the VA in Seattle. His ankle was swollen up the size of a football. He came to the front door, called the in to get help to come into the, uh, into the emergency room, and guess what? They told him to call 911. Fortunately, he was able to do that. Paramedics came, they got him in, but I thought that that was just inexcusable. And so I was very happy that the House of Representatives passed my bill to make sure that never happens again. And I will continue to work as tirelessly to make sure that veterans of this country get the kind of care that they deserve. Because like I said, they were there for us to keep our country free, to protect our Constitution. And this, this government needs to be there for them when they need us. Thank you, Mr. Didier. This government's not there for them. Just the, the, one of the latest stories, Phoenix, 200 more vets died waiting for care. We keep being told that they're gonna fix the VA, that our veterans are gonna get the care they deserve. And we, the people, keep being patient. I think it's time that we really look at downscaling the VA, the administrative costs that are eating the budget big time. And I think that we get it down to a, a uh, manageable VA that collects and disperses the funds to our veterans to go to the doctor and the hospital of their choice. Just this last weekend, a 28-year-old man named Drew Goodman put on a, an event over here for our veterans, raised money for them, for our Navy SEALs. Got to meet a couple of those fine young men. One of them just got back and uh, had a confrontation with the Taliban that was 400 to 15, and they, they won. They pushed him back, but he lost one of his friends. They said it was a lucky shot, head shot, and he's having a hard time dealing with it. Talking with these veterans, they're having to fight tooth and nail to be seen by the VA. This is wrong, folks. You tell me what part of government that you've seen run efficiently and effective. It hasn't. We need our veterans to be assured that they're going to get the care they deserve because they were the ones that put it all on the line for us. And I thank every veteran out there for your service. And that's why I went and spoke to those veterans, because I'm deeply honored and humbled to meet these men and to talk with them. They are our heroes and they need to be taken care of. 
Thank you, Mr. Didier. Most of us take our energy supply and digital communications for granted. How vulnerable do you think the United States actually is at this current point to either natural disasters or sabotage when it comes to our energy grid and our reliance on computer networks? And what can be done about this? Well, you're seeing that across the nation. We're having storms, we're having hurricanes, we're having storms, and you're having power outages right here in the state of Washington. We're having problems everywhere. And that's why I'm part of the uh, COS here in the Tri-Cities, Committees of Safety. It never hurts to be prepared, folks. Joe Gibbs always told us when we were getting ready to take uh, on the next team, when we first got our game plan, he always told us, get ready for the worst possible predicament you can imagine. That way you'll never be surprised. And the same is true for all of us. You need to have a food supply put together. You need to have a water supply, emergency energy, a means of protecting yourself a ham radio so that you can communicate. If we were to lose our power and our, if we had a solar flare or if God forbid an EMP go off, your phones wouldn't work, your cars wouldn't work, what would you do? So this is what you're taught. You put yourself in situational type things and then you, and then you prepare for that. And my opponent and those people on the west side, they had fun with that last election too. But there's a lot of people in the United States now that are becoming very aware of being prepared. It doesn't hurt. It's food that you can eat at any time, and it doesn't hurt to have it there and have your family ready for any natural or man-made disaster. And you're hearing more and more of this. So I'm waiting for this demonizing ad to come out again here and show me as a crazy guy again, because I'm not. I'm a father, a grandfather, and I want to protect my family. I want them to be safe and secure in times of disaster. Thank you. All right, thank you. I wanted to get through uh, the library. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Jenkins. <laughs> We're all stuck here. Maybe that could be a disaster. Anybody got any MREs? Anyway, all right, um, Congressman Newhouse. That may be the first time I ever got uh, at a library when it closed. I don't know. Um, um, the question about our infrastructure, whether from um, uh, hackers or from natural disaster, is a real one. The, the, you know, our infrastructure has been in place for a long time, as far as our electrical grid, um, uh, some of the infrastructure in our communities, our cities, um, our energy uh, resources. Uh, I've been uh, privy to, to some of the uh, classified brief briefings on some of this, these issues, and, and the threat is real whether it's from North Korea or from Russia or from countries that are trying to raise havoc within, uh, within our infrastructure, infrastructure system, we are on constant vigilance as a country uh, defending ourselves from, from this, this true threat. And it's something that uh, we need to make sure that we have the resources available. The, the, the bill that my opponent uh, uh, complains that I, I, I supported had and a record amount of resources available for the Department of Homeland Security, something that I take very seriously, the making sure our country is safe. And this is one of the uh, aspects of that, uh, making sure our, our uh, energy system, our infrastructure as it relates to our energy, uh, remains safe and secure. I I'm old enough to remember the brownouts and the blackouts that we used to hear about all the time in California and the, the uh, uh, tremendous impact that had on, on uh, the economy at the time. We've been fortunate enough we haven't had those for a while uh, because we've made a lot of improvements over the years. And, but, but we are vulnerable. We truly are. I don't mean to concern everybody or, or unduly concern you, but we are under constant threat from countries that uh, mean to do us harm and cause mischief. And so we need to make sure that we have all of the resources in place to be able to combat those constant uh, threats. One more question? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, this will be the final question from our audience. And Congressman Newhouse, this for you. Please tell us, uh, hold on, let me decipher this a little bit. Please tell us the accomplishment that you are most proud of in your first term in Congress. And Mr. Didier, for you, what would be your main goal if you're elected? Congressman Newhouse, we'll start with you. My proudest accomplishment. Uh, well, if I could take a little bit of license with that. The, I mentioned the 
the VET Act that I, I was a primary sponsor of that ensures veterans receive the emergent care that they need. I think uh, as something that I can look at and point to as something I'm proud of, I truly am uh, proud that we're making improvements in the, the way that veterans are treated by the Veterans Administration facilities around this country. Uh, that's something that um, uh, uh, I've gotten a lot of uh, veterans thanking me for, for those efforts, and so I got to point to that with pride. I'm also um, very proud of the c efforts that I continued from my predecessor of uh, making sure the search continued for a, a young lieutenant colonel who was lost in the Vietnam War flying over Vietnam, Mr. Or Lieutenant Colonel San D. Francisco, a local boy whose dear sister Terry has spent every year since then, um, every waking moment, I think, thinking about finding the remains of her dear brother. And we're making great progress there. I wish I could report to you that they found those remains, but they are looking Fortunately, they started looking this summer, and I, I'm, she and I are optimistic they're going, they're going to find something so she can put uh, the memory of her lost brother uh, to rest and that she can rest easier. Thank you, Mr. Didier. Well, I've already stated it. The first bill I introduce will be that Congress, the House, and the Senate live by the same laws that they pass on to you and I. Now, is that going to be easy to get my constituents to sign on to? No. It's going to take the people of this country to tell their constituents, either you vote for this or you're being voted out in the next election. The other bill that I'd like to introduce right off the bat is that the constituents, the, the congressmen, live with their constituents. That means you stay in your district and you use Skype and the new technology to place the order for debate and vote on bills. That way you stay here. And you don't get lost in D.C. Because you see, I lived in D.C. for seven years. And it's not a place I want to go back to, to tell you the truth. I want to stay with my grandkids. But sometimes you got to do things you don't really want to do. I'm willing to go back to D.C. And I'm willing to fight for freedom. Sow the seeds of freedom for everyone. So that every generation to come, all of our posterity, will have their shot at the American dream. Thank you both. Time to get to closing statements now. And Mr. Didier, we'll start with you. Well, my, uh, my opponent is proud of his endorsement of the papers. And I got to tell you, the Tri-City Herald, well, they've already sold their building to a pharmaceutical outfit, and they're going to be moving to Yakima. I am proud to say that I got the endorsement of a voice. And David Cartinas is here tonight. And they have a 64,000 per month readership. The Herald is down at 45. They're losing their readers. You see, we don't have a, a honest paper anymore in the Tri-Cities to report on what truly is going on. Now, I also have the endorsement of Benton County, Franklin County, Douglas County, and Okanagan County Republican parties. We both got grants approval to run for office. The other three counties don't endorse. Why are the Republicans leaving Dan in Groves? Is because he's not a conservative and he's not fighting for America and your liberty. Vote Clint for Clint Didier for Congress. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Newhouse. Well, thank you, Mike, and thank everybody for being here this evening. It's an honor to appear before you. And I appreciate your interest, like I said, in participating in our, in our government. Uh, I stand before you uh, proud of my voting record. Like I said, every decision I make, every vote I take on your behalf, I'm deliberate, I'm thoughtful, I think about how it impacts people uh, in the 4th District. Because you know what? This is my home. You're my neighbors. I want to make sure that every decision I make is the best decision I can make on your behalf. It's an honor to represent you in Washington, D.C., but it's a huge responsibility and one that I take very seriously. I want to thank you for the opportunity you've given me to do that, 
and I ask for your continued support so I can continue to work to continue to work on your behalf. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Newhouse, Clint Didier. Thank you both.